Welcome to Grill the Affiliate Manager. Um, this is basically a dream come true for any affiliate to have the opportunity to have a bunch of affiliate managers on a stage, on video, where we can ask them anything that we want to ask them and it's going to be preserved for eternity so we can go back and if they lie, we can call them out on it. So uh, this is a great opportunity for us as affiliates. Um, hopefully there's also some merchants in the room. Do we have any merchants in the room? A few merchants. I think this is going to be a good opportunity for the merchants to hear some of the things that affiliate managers are doing for their programs, some of the things that they should be doing. Do we happen to have any other affiliate managers? A few. All right. Hopefully, we'll have some good tips for you too. Um, just you know, comparison-wise, I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that affiliates are looking for, and they'll talk about through their experience what they know about that. Um, so, how many affiliates do we have in the room? I'm going to be looking to all of you for some questions at the end, too. So make sure you tweet it out. So if your friends have any questions, too, they can send them to me. Um, here's all of our contact information real quick. If you just want to take down um, any of our Twitter names in particular, if there's anything that you want to call them out for in the middle of the presentation. Um, real quickly, you know, there's the agenda. We're going to do just a little bit of background on everybody. Uh, my favorite part, I think, of this whole thing is going to be the speed round, where I have selected questions for them that they have no idea what they are, and they can only answer yes or no. So no excuses, no explanations, yes or no. And I have a laser pointer in case I need that. Um, so those are some of the main things we're going to be talking about, though, approving and rejecting affiliates, communications, um, benefits of why you'd want to work with an affiliate manager, and then lastly, the audience questions, so store those up for the end. Um, I'm Trisha Meyer. I own Sunshine Rewards. I've been in affiliate marketing for about eight years. Um, I also do consulting, content, um, blogging, things like that, so kind of all around. I work with a lot of different affiliate managers, a lot of OPMs, all three of these up here. <laughs> Um, so they kind of know what's coming for them today. Um, but I'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, Greg Hoffman? I am Greg Hoffman. I own uh, an affiliate management company. I've been an affiliate manager for nine years. Uh, my team, uh, I've got a team of four people at Greg Hoffman Consulting. We manage our programs together. So we all work as a team. All right. Rebecca. Hi, I'm Rebecca Pollard. I manage the affiliate programs for Pet360 Incorporated, which includes three websites, PetMD.com, PetFoodDirect.com, and Pet360.com. Um, and I've been an affiliate manager for them for about two years now. Previously, I worked as a buyer for their company. So I'm really familiar with all of their products and building partnerships with their manufacturers. And that's how I was able to transfer all of that experience over to being an affiliate manager. Mr. Nunez. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Mike Nunez. I'm the co-founder of AffiliateManager.com. We've uh, been in affiliate marketing since about 1999, um, and we manage about 70 different affiliate programs in all kinds of verticals, so we should be able to answer a bunch of your questions. All right, so basically, <coughs> sorry, on the panel, <coughs> We have um, in-house versus out outsourced affiliate management. A little bit of difference in that, so you will hear a little bit different. Um, we do have two outsourced program managers, OPMs, but I'm just going to use the terminology of affiliate managers throughout the presentation to um, make it a little bit easier. We do have Rebecca, who's been in it a little bit more recently, and then Greg and Mike have been in it a little bit longer. We do not have any network management up here, so that's one thing that we didn't pull into this panel. Um, when you have, you know, for example, Commission Junction and Linkshare have their in-house people there that manage programs. That's one thing that we won't be talking about today. And at the end, um, the, your mileage may vary. You know, these are only three people. They don't represent the entire industry, but hopefully it's going to be a good cross-section for us. So how important is the relationship with affiliate manager? Just a couple of slides to start out to talk about, you know, why do we even care? Why is this such an important relationship? Um, this came from the 2013 Affiliate Summit AFSTAT report. <clears throat> and basically what you can see here is that you know, roughly 73% of the respondents said that in some way the affiliate management um, will dictate how they work with the program, how much they work with the program, um, why they join the program, whether they promote the program heavily or, you know, things like that. So when you're talking about over 70% of affiliates saying that affiliate management is, you know, a key part of um, <clears throat> what they're willing to promote and how they promote it, you can see why it's so important. And what affiliates say, um, I won't read these to you, but these are some really nice quotes that came out of the 2010 AFSTAT report, um, what affiliates think of affiliate managers sometimes. Um, I think one of my favorites is, affiliate managers rarely make any effort to respond to my problems, complaints, or requests for help. <clears throat> 
Moving on. Uh, all right, speed round time. The 10 well, things they have no more. idea. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so these are questions that came in part. I um, did a blog post a couple of weeks ago asking people if they had questions that, you know, just wanted to offer them up kind of anonymously. So um, basic rules. Yes or no, no explanations. Later on, once we get past the speed round, they'll have a little bit more time to explain some of the things we talk about. But for now, we just want to kick things off. Are you personally an affiliate in any affiliate programs? Mike. Yes. 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 Do you allow toolbars of any kind in programs that you manage? Yes. Yes. No. Do you allow coupon sites in any of the programs that you manage? Yes. 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 Do you ever give special coupons or commission rates to specific affiliates? Yes. Yes? Yes. Do you get any benefit from the networks by convincing merchants to move their programs there? No. 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 Should affiliate managers provide personal contact information in every email they send out to affiliates? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes. That was an extra word, Rebecca. Cheater. <laughs> Um, should OPMs represent competing merchants? So merchants that have maybe the same niche that they're in? Yes. That doesn't apply to me, but I would say no. No. Is there a conflict of interest when a network manages a merchant's program? Yes. 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 Are any of your programs set up to auto-approve affiliates? No. 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 Do you require affiliates in your programs to comply with FTC disclosure guidelines? Yes. 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 Oh, very nice. <laughs> I think that was impressive. All right. So let's actually get into some of the meat of why you came here. Um, thinking about the questions that we just asked, we did that in part to kind of spur your thoughts of things that you might be thinking about what you're wondering um, what affiliate managers do and how they do things. So start thinking about your questions as we'll go through some of them where we're going to give them a little bit more time to explain things. Um, first, we're going to talk about the approving and rejecting affiliate thing. We have a lot of affiliates that complain, you know, why was I rejected from a program? How can I get approved for a program? Things like that. It's really important for affiliates to hear firsthand from affiliate managers what that process looks like. So um, let me ask, we'll start with Greg. What are the top three reasons you'll decline an affiliate from your program? Top three. Um, I don't know, I didn't do my homework. Uh, I would say um, lack of relevancy to the merchant, um, whether or not they have a toolbar, and whether or not they have negative feedback on their uh, description. Okay. And that, so that's within the network, whether there's any feed, right. negative feedback from um, other merchants. All right. Do either of you have anything to add to those other things that you would reject an affiliate outright for? Um, sure. I would say if your website isn't ready yet, I typically wouldn't approve you. Um, obviously, I'm happy to have emails of people reaching out who want to explain the circumstances, but typically if your, email, if your website isn't ready, we won't let you in the program. Yeah, and I would add, um, so a lot of times you're able to provide a bigger description. Obviously, a lot of times affiliates, they, the site that they apply with isn't necessarily the site that they're going to promote the program on. Mm -hmm. So make sure to give that information because we go off of what we see, and if we don't know that, then we can't uh, approve you. So, and we want to. We want to have you in the program, but it needs to be, as Greg said, relevant. Um, brand incongruency, if it's not uh, good for the brand to be listed on that site, um, a lot of times we won't be able to approve you there. Um, the model, so when I say an affiliate model, it could be um, whether or not you guys have cash back or not, or um, sometimes coupons are not allowed. It depends on the merchant, so a lot of the stuff that comes out in the beginning. Um, so dovetailing with that about coupons, what are the pros and cons of allowing coupon sites into your programs? Mike? Who I go first this time? <laughs> so I would say the pros. Uh, urgency. A, a lot of times people don't know when that coupon code is going to expire. They feel like uh, they're about to get a really good deal and they want to make that purchase, right? So you want to have that urgency. Um, you also have deal-driven consumers. A lot of times consumers really just are looking for a deal. And a lot of times when you have map pricing, it's difficult to show a lower price than what the manufacturer allows you to. So coupons allow you to get below that, or get around that map pricing while not violating your manufacturer's policy. Um, 
increase order value. If you do coupons right, uh, you can actually set it at a higher uh, than your average order value, help get that average order, order value up. And so that was all the good things. To me, the bad thing is um, potentially a decreased margin. If, if you were going to get that customer anyway, you could potentially lose a little bit of margin uh, by having that coupon site in the program. Rebecca, anything to add? Um, yeah, I would say, you know, uh, the consumer is definitely going out and searching for coupons, so you want to have some sort of presence there. For us, it could be free shipping, um, or with other sites, it could be a coupon that you're giving away as a discount on your products that you're buying. Um, I would also say that coupons can be great if you want to um, compare yourself to the competitors. So for us, you know, we're really competitive with our coupons, whether it's a cashback or a points website, we're always really competitive competitive with our commissions, and so when the consumer's there, they can see that we're beating out our competitors and definitely come to our site. I'm very picky about the coupon sites that I work with. There's a handful of sites that I will work with personally. Uh, there are thousands of coupon sites that add no value at all and I'm very particular about letting them into the program and then monitoring them uh, throughout the, the life of their uh, promotions. But like I said, there's a very small number of coupon sites that I work with and I police them every single day to make sure they're compliant. Can I, can I add something on to Rebecca made a really good point that I want to say. Um, it's also beneficial to be able to control the message, right? So mm -hmm. they're not in your program. They're a user-generated content type site. Uh, a lot of times that can get out of hand, and it helps to control the message if they're in your program, you're able to work with them. Terrific. All right, let's go back to the toolbar question. Um, we had a difference of opinion on the panel on that one, so let's talk about that. Do you think that allowing toolbars in your program impacts other affiliates, and if so, how or how not? Uh, Rebecca, you want to start? Sure. Um, I would say that toolbars are definitely going to affect other affiliates in some way, shape, or form. Um, typically, toolbars are going to be the last click, and in that case, you could potentially be stealing commissions away from other affiliates. So um, definitely something that, as an affiliate manager, we have to pay a lot of attention to and continuously research um, how our affiliates are, are driving the traffic to our sites. Anyone want to add to that? Sure. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I want to make it clear that, yes, there are sometimes toolbars in the programs that we manage, um, but it's completely up to the merchant. We have to, our job is to educate the merchant on what it is that toolbar affiliates do. Now, uh, it can affect other affiliates. The, the biggest way it affects you, if you think about, is everybody here familiar with, with toolbar affiliates? No, okay. Uh, and, yeah, sorry, sorry, let's, let's take a step back. Um, a good example are Ebates and Upromise, right? Um, Ebates, ebates.com and YouPromise are two good examples. Um, they have uh, what's called a browser helper object. I don't know if, it, if it's still called that. This is, I'm, showing, I'm showing my age up here. Um, it's a browser helper object. Basically what happens is an application on the end consumer's computer that they installed on their computer, right? They want to get their rebate from Ebates. They want to get their cash back from YouPromise, right? So they install this so that they get it every single time. Now let's think about how that affects the, the merchant overall, not just their affiliate program. So what happens is if a user goes to, let's just say, I'll use Best Buy. A user goes to bestbuy.com, they just type in bestbuy.com. This application grabs that traffic, redirects it through the affiliate link, and lands them on Best Buy. Now, they didn't go to YouPromise, they didn't go to Ebates, they didn't even click on a link. They just landed on Best Buy, right? And they're <laughs> taking that commission. That's a direct one. And I'll try to make this quicker. Sorry, Sorry. You're fine. I, th this could take forever. Uh, the second thing about if somebody had a paid search click, somebody clicked on a paid search link, got redirected, landed on Best Buy. Now Best Buy paid for the click. They're also paying for the commission. The third scenario is if somebody goes to a blog, <coughs> looks on a blog, clicks on a link on a blog, uh, an affiliate link to Best Buy, gets redirected. Now that affiliate potentially doesn't get their commission. The, U the toolbar affiliate will get the commission. So that's why it's a very scary thing. It, it's in the wrong hands. It's a very dangerous affiliate to have in your program, especially if an affiliate manager doesn't know what, doesn't know what they're doing. Um, now that said, there is incremental value. They do drive people from their sites to, um, to those retailers, right? Uh, so it, it, you have to be able to measure that. You have to make sure that the merchant is aware of that. You have to prepare, do things like use and app source equals one. I know that's, <coughs> again, I'm showing my age there. But that still <clears throat> doesn't 
save affiliates from their cookie duration. So that's where clickstream and attribution come in. You gotta make sure that if you have any of those in there, that if an affiliate comes in, or it, depending on the network, Avant Link's a good example that has, where you can have this for all marketing, pro marketing programs, you can say, if anybody else is in the clickstream, anybody else generated a click there, do not fire for this, for this affiliate. So you, you can do it. You have to do it the right way or you're gonna hurt your affiliates. Greg, do you wanna add anything to that? I'm adamant that I don't want to work with toolbars in any of my programs. If any of my merchants want to work with toolbars, I don't necessarily want to work with that merchant. Uh, I don't see where <laughs> <laughs> I don't see where the toolbars add value at all. I want my programs to be as profitable as possible, and I want my affiliates, especially my content affiliates, to have as uh, conversion as high as possible. So I'm out there protecting the merchant's profitability and the affiliate's conversion. Is there any way to work? with those affiliates and opt out of the toolbars? There is, but there's also the stigma that you're still working with the toolbars. And so I just made the decision not to work with them because I haven't, they do add new customers, but the new customer ratio is not uh, in favor of, compared to the, the existing customer ratio. So they can give me new customers, but it's not worth it. But with today's tools, you can use attribution to pay accordingly. You could say, we'll only pay you on new customers that you bring that you haven't before. So again, there are ways to do it. If you just do it blindly, then you're, you're gonna get damaged. And a lot, that's the problem, is a lot of affiliate managers do it very wrong. Um, and it hurts not only their program, but the affiliates in their program, their paid search channel, everything. So it's, again, it's a very, they're, they're very difficult if you do it wrong. So affiliates will often ask me, um, how do I even know if a merchant that I'm working with is working with a toolbar or not? Um, that's where that communication with the affiliate managers really comes into play, you know, that you have this relationship with your OPMs, with the affiliate managers that you can just, you know, flat ask them about it. Or you can always go to those sites and just, you know, check them out and see. Um, you can sometimes even Google, like, the name of the merchant and cashback or toolbar or something like that, and it'll just pop up and automatically tell you that. So there are a few different ways you can find it, but really communicating and getting this information, if there's a merchant you really wanted to work with that Mike has, and they're working with the, with the toolbar, talking to him and saying, you know, what are you doing about this? What if I, am I losing commissions? Can you guarantee me that I'm not losing commissions? And keep those lines of communication open. Can I add one more thing? Sorry. Sure. So I, I do want to say our recommendation for every merchant in this room and that we manage is that they do not work with toolbars. I just want to make it sure it's clear that they aren't, they aren't completely deadly if you manage them right. So when when we do work with a merchant and we educate them on this, they say, that's okay, I still want to work with them, then we make sure that it's done right. But our recommendation is absolutely not to work with them. And I'd like to add one more thing too. Um, from a competitive standpoint, some of the toolbars can actually be very helpful. So if you, again, are beating out your competitors when it comes to price, then when someone visits your competitor site, they'll be able to see that and can come back to place the order. So that's one reason why um, I haven't completely ruled them out. But again, I know Greg's going to kill me. <laughs> we have to be very <laughs> careful with how we work with them and, and looking at the click stream. I appreciate the honest responses. <laughs> All right, let's move into communicating with affiliates. Um, this is I'm taken from the 2013 Affiliate Summit AFSAT report, and basically they asked affiliates you know, how they want to be communicated with, in what ways, and you can see it's really across the board. You know, so for the OPMs and the merchants, they're having to find ways to communicate with all of us when we all want to be communicated with in different ways. I personally do not take phone calls. If anybody calls, except for maybe these three, <laughs> um, if affiliate managers call and I either see that I don't know the number or, you know, if it's somebody like cold calling me to talk about something or ask me to run a promotion, I don't answer the phone. I would rather talk to someone via email and deal with it that way or Skype or something like that. Um, but you can see, you know, other people. I want to know who wants the video, like who wants their affiliate managers to send them a video, that 1.3% that wants to watch affiliate manager videos all day. I can think of a lot better things to watch. Um, email from the affiliate network is what they seem to like the best. So those emails where they're just putting them in, they're kicking them out to all of us. Um, not personalized, customized, anything like that. So let's talk about some of those things. Um, you know, personally, I'm in a thousand programs, and I know that some affiliate managers get really upset when I don't read the newsletters because they'll say, well, I put that in a newsletter. Why didn't you read that? And I say, because for the most part, I don't read your newsletters. 
Um, I might skim them. I might look, you know, for certain keywords that I'm looking for. But for the most part, with a thousand newsletters coming in, you know, every month, some of them twice a month, there's not time for that for me personally. Um, do you expect affiliates to read your newsletters? And how do you differentiate um, your programs when we're getting so much information coming into us? What are good ways for affiliate managers to make sure that affiliates are reading them? Greg? We try to send a, a, a basic template every month to every merchant uh, or through every merchant and um, we, we don't add a lot of fluff. We add the deal of the month. We add uh, some information about a certain product. We add an image. We want to keep it as simple as, as possible. We don't want to add long uh, emails just so they can skim it, see what it is, and then move on to the next newsletter. Rebecca? Um, we send newsletters probably about once a month, and uh, we do add some fluff, as Greg likes to put it. <laughs> um, the great thing about Pet360 is that we have not only a commerce um, part of our website, but we also have tons of content. So um, we recently started splitting our newsletters to focus on either coupon or, lo or loyalty sites versus content sites, whether that's bloggers or niche content websites. Um, so for the content websites, we are sending out syndication opportunities. We're sending out article ideas that could potentially include some of the products that we're selling. Um, and we're also sending out articles that they could potentially share on social media that would be of interest to their, their readers or consumers. Mike? So we send out a lot of newsletters. <laughs> um, we maybe sometimes too much, but um, we do send, what we want to do is we want to provide value, right? And we figure if we provide value and you guys open the email, you're going to keep opening the email. We also make it very clear who the email's from, what network that they're on, the program that this is, um, and what's inside of it, just in the subject line. We, we don't want to force feed anybody. I think expect them to open it up is a strong word. We would absolutely like them to, because it does have value inside. Um, and with the, and, and so uh, this is a recommendation I have for everybody here that manages affiliate programs. A lot of networks have very good tools, like ShareSale in particular is fantastic for being able to set up custom campaigns. So one campaign that we do is how, how can we help? And we look at who hasn't even sent a click, but they've joined the program over the last 90 days, right? And they haven't even sent one click yet. How, we send out a newsletter. How can we help? What can we do for you? We get a tremendous response from that. So if you customize it, you'll get a better response. That said, I'll, I'll fully admit it, we probably send a few too many emails. <laughs> but I, I mean, what would you rather us not send anything, right? So we, we're, we're just doing the best that we can for our clients. I'm sure that you all get a lot of emails from affiliates asking you a lot of questions about affiliate marketing. You know, how do I pull a link? How do I pull a banner? Asking you questions in general about affiliate marketing. Um, to what extent do you think the affiliate managers are responsible for that kind of education, and to what extent do you just tell them, you know, refer them out either to network resources or other blogs or things like that? I'll take it, Rebecca. Sure. Um, I try to be as helpful as possible to the affiliates that we're working with. So, um, you know, what I provide to them is to the extent of my knowledge, there's some questions that I can't answer, in which case I would direct them to a person at the network to help answer that question. But um, at the end of the day, I want to be the person who's helping them so they don't have to go through another person, another person. It, it, it's easier, much more convenient, and uh, faster for everyone if I can be the person to help them. Greg? It might be a little cold, but it's not my job to teach you how to be an affiliate. <laughs> it's my job to teach you how to sell the products that are from my merchant. So we will tell you everything about our merchant, our products, and how to promote those products, but I can't tell you how to build a website and how to drive traffic to it. So that's when we send you to the networks or to other resources like Sean Collins' Extra Money Answer book. We send that out to so many affiliates every week. You wanna repeat Just that slowly for them? <laughs> <laughs> Sean Collins has a book called Extra Money Answer. Uh, I think it's extramoneyanswer.com. Uh, so that's the, the number one resource we send out. Mike? It is 100% the affiliate manager's job to help their affiliates be successful in whatever it takes. So, and it's very time consuming, very time consuming to do it. But um, we've actually, and, and forgive me for talking about us, but this is just how you can handle it. We've developed tools uh, to make that easier. Uh, a good example is bounce links that we, that we made. It helps affiliates make a direct link on any program that we manage with the click of a button. So it's 
I think it's our responsibility for the success of the overall program. We run several different campaigns for all our affiliates. One of is optimization. In that optimization campaign, we, we work and say, what, what can we provide? Can give us access to your site. We'll <laughs> update the links for you. Um, whatever it takes to, to make the program successful for our client. I think I need to talk to you more often, maybe. Yes, you do. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> All right, let's work, um, talk a little bit about the benefits of working with affiliate managers. Um, you know, there are the in-house managers, there are the OPMs, so let's talk a little bit about those differences as we go through the questions as well. But um, what does an affiliate need to do to get a special rate or exclusive coupon or something like that from you? How do they approach that and how should they do that? Mike? <clears throat> so the problem with that, I think Greg made a great point earlier that there are thousands of coupon sites. And so <clears throat> we have to be selective. We all do, we all have to be selective. An advantage coupon, for a thousand different affiliate sites, while, while it looks interesting, isn't, isn't really effective. Um, so we certainly work with the larger coupon sites for things like that. Um, so in other words, you have to be driving some value already <laughs> to, for, in order for us to go and justify that internally with the client. Rebecca? Um, I would say for us, it's just ask. Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get it, but let's talk about it. Let's talk about the additional things we can be doing. Um, I'm always open to the conversation. Um, you know, typically, if you can give us a placement on your site, we'll give you a commission increase or an exclusive coupon. So there's definitely ways that we can work together to figure something out that would be beneficial for both of us. It's surprising to me how few affiliates know that, you know, that they actually have that negotiation power, that, it, that is their what they can provide to you, um, whether it's the placement opportunities or email drops or things like that, that they do have that power. Absolutely. You want to add anything, Greg? We do give our short list of couponers vanity codes, but we love giving vanity codes to bloggers. Mm -hmm. uh, they, it, whenever they ask, uh, we, we give them almost anything they want. <laughs> it's, it, he, he makes a great point. Bloggers, you guys are, are very, very attractive to affiliate programs. So. Well, it would be a blogger with following. We would, we would look at the, uh, you know, they're, they're following on Twitter and Facebook, but we're still going to work with them closely. Even if they don't have a, a good following, we're still going to work with them more than uh, some general coupon site out of a different country. And, and, and for you sneaky, sneaky coupon sites, don't go start a blog and then ask for a coupon code and go post it on your coupon site. We, we, I, I'm not sure, I think we all use the same software to monitor coupon codes out on the internet, so we, we will find you, and you won't like the result. Yeah. Do you want to drop any names of what you use, just to, uh, for those out there who might be looking for options? 100% brand verity. Yeah. It's, Absolutely. It's fantastic. If you're not using it in your program, you're, you're costing your company money. Brand Verity. Brandverity.com. They are here. I, they, had a, they may have a booth. I absolutely encourage you to go talk to them. If you want to talk to them, I would say if you just tweet at Brand Verity, can I meet up with you somewhere, they'll, they'll respond to you and find you. Is there a question in the middle? I mean, we'll run over to the mic just so we make sure we get it on the video. Hello. I'm Dan, Gramza Interactive. I have a question about coupon sites. How can they increase their value and benefit to you guys? So which one, what types? Coupon sites. Coupon, coupon sites. Um, whichever one of you want to take it. I can, you can. Sure, go ahead. Um, so mm -hmm. there are, here's how a coupon site doesn't provide a tremendous value. Just bidding on trademark plus terms, right? Well, that's beneficial in some, in some way, if that's all you're doing, you're not a beneficial, not, not beneficial overall. As a coupon site, you have to be able to go and get those deal-seeking consumers. So focus on more um, broad terms. So for example, if uh, I'll use Best Buy. Uh, instead of just bidding on Best Buy coupons, go find a way to get people that are looking for good deals on Yamaha receivers, right? And then have a listing on your site of all the Yamaha receivers that are on a really good deal that day. Uh, that's a way to bring in incremental customers for the retailers. And some of these coupon sites have large email databases. So if we can get them to mail out an offer to their customers, you know, some of them could have five million customers. That's, those are five million eyes that might not be customers of ours. So 
anything they can add to it, especially newsletters or extra placement on categories, uh, not just the, the standard landing page for the brand. Uh, I'd like to, to see some of them give me some better placement on, on category pages as well. All right, the next question has gotten a lot of discussion um, on blogs and revenues and ABW in places over the last few years, and that is affiliate managers who are also affiliates. And that can come in a lot of different forms. Maybe an affiliate manager who, you know, on their blog puts up, um, you know, HostGator links or something like that because they have a business blog, so they want to get a little bit of B2B affiliate um, commission. It could also be um, affiliate managers that are joining programs of their competitors so that they can keep tabs on those programs. And and it may be affiliate managers who were formerly affiliates, so they already have a lot of sites built up, and now they've become affiliate managers, and they've kept those sites. Um, I think most affiliates, we're very afraid of affiliate managers that are affiliates because we feel like you know, that's competition with us. If I talk to them about a promotion I'm doing, are they going to get that idea, and they're going to go and talk to, or they're going to go do that with their company? And I think so. For affiliates, I think we don't like the idea of affiliate managers also being affiliates. But all three of them up here said they are, and I do think that's representative of affiliate managers in general. So I'd like them to kind of justify a little bit why it's okay or talk about you know, what the pros are of affiliate managers being affiliates as well. Greg? I am not an affiliate uh, in any of my programs. I'm not an affiliate in any of my competitors' programs, meaning my merchant's competitors. I'm not an affiliate in any of his programs, or I'm not in Becca's programs, but I am an affiliate for Affiliate Summit, uh, so I'm happy if anyone buys a ticket through, <laughs> through my link. Uh, I'm also an affiliate, I think, for superhero stuff and probably for Bluehost. So we need to see the, what you see as an affiliate, so we need to have access to the networks uh, and, and, and understand what you're going through. So yes, we, we, I am an affiliate, but for a very small group. Okay, Rebecca? Um, yeah, I'm kind of along the same lines. I um, am an affiliate outside of the pet industry, so I think it just gives me the opportunity to really understand what our affiliates are going through and trying to build up their websites and also having an understanding of um, how to make affiliate links work in content marketing. Um, so really it just gives me the opportunity to learn and grow um, as an affiliate manager because I'm experiencing the same things you guys are experiencing. Anything to add, Mike? Yeah, I mean, I said yes, mostly because we have an affiliate monetization service that basically runs through us, but uh, it's not like we're out there building, we're not blogging and uh, trying to monetize those links. So, you know, again, we have a, like a blogger monetization service, so. So you're an affiliate in I'm all those merchant programs that, for those. Just to make it easier for bloggers, but it, that's pretty much it. All right. All right. So now we get to the portion of the program where we need some feedback from all of you. Um, I did get a few other questions that came in before the sessions, um, before other questions that came in via Twitter, so I'll start with those while you all get your questions together. Um, the first one, I, it was really shocking to me when I heard about it. Do you know of or engage in the practice of affiliate managers getting kickbacks from affiliates for any type of special placement opportunities or exclusives? That's an easy speed round question. Yeah, no. <laughs> it, it, it does exist. I I have been solicited, and I have had to, I've had to say no. Um, so there are paid search affiliates out there that are offering kickbacks, um, and, and that just crosses every ethical line I could possibly think of. But it does exist out there. Hey, yeah, go ahead. It, it, it's so easy. If you're an affiliate manager and you get that email, like if they're willing to cross that line, what are they willing to do in your program? Uh, so, uh, you know, the re proper reaction is hit the decline button on them in the program. All right. Um, are affiliate managers paid a flat rate or a rev share based on sales in the program? And if it's a rev share, does that impact the affiliate commissions at all? Oh, Mike? sorry. Um, we, we offer different packages, and some of them are a base rate plus, um, plus rev share, or some of them are just a flat fee. Um, it does not affect affiliate commissions in that somebody needs to manage the program, right? So they're either going to hire an affiliate manager outsourced or they're going to hire somebody in-house to manage their program. They're going to budget for that position and then they're going to also look at the profit margin and base the affiliate commission off of that. Now that said, if it was a perfect world and there was no need for an affiliate manager or an OPM, <laughs> could the commissions potentially be more? Absolutely. But there's a need for us in the program and I think in a way we save enough uh, in commissions for our affiliates to justify the cost that it does cost uh, to have us. Okay. 
Uh, Path 360 does not offer any kind of incentive for the performance of the program, and that's probably the difference of having an in-house program versus um, OPMs, although I'm sure Mike and Greg can speak to really the differences in OPMs. Um, for us, it's all based on the commissions that you receive and the coupons that we can give out is all based on how well our affiliates are performing. So if you can drive new customers, then we can offer a higher commission. Yeah, most of mine are flat fee. I've got a couple small rev share, but they do not affect the affiliate commissions. I'm always trying to convince the merchants, don't include my fee in your ROI of the entire program because you have to look at us as an employee and you still have to have an employee to manage it. So don't, don't add that all together. Here's a question that came in. How quickly should affiliates expect to get responses from you when they reach out? About three or four minutes. <laughs> now, it, with me, because I'm just I'm online all the time and I'm connected. I'm always going to answer immediately, but I give them a standard 24 hours notice. Yeah, for me, I try to answer within 24 hours. Um, I'm involved in some other parts of our business as well, so it's a little bit more difficult to be 100% responsive within a day. Um, but that's always my goal. I agree. With what do you look for in, a, in affiliate applications beyond just what's in the network application itself? What kinds of things are you looking for? Rebecca? Um, I always look at the website first. So really, I want to understand the consumer experience. And um, outside of that, you know, we're looking at your social media um, and how many followers and fans you've got there. Um, we also all talk to each other. So there is potentially a blacklist that you could end up on, and we'll reference that. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. There's, there's a blacklist. I'm not going to tell you where it is. Because <laughs> I don't want you to find your way off of it if, if you're doing things wrong. Um, definitely look at the network feedback. We do talk to each other. Um, Avest Web is a good resource. Um, typically, if, if there's any question, we'll go to that site and, and do a search to see if anybody's talking about that, about that affiliate. Um, so that's, again, a, a good resource. Um, we do go look at things like, uh, do they have a, a private domain? Um, again, the network feedback, if you're not familiar, Everybody can put feedback on, in ShareSale in particular, and that's where most of our programs are. Um, you can go to ShareSale and, and leave feedback on affiliates, so we do look at that pretty heavily. And they have a, a comment section where you can add additional information that we do read as well. Greg, anything else? I look at all the domains as, as fast as possible because I'm, I'm trying to hit them all at the same time. But um, I'm, I'm looking at the their, their domains, I'm looking at the feedback, um, and I'm, I'm just, it, the other thing is I look at whether or not they've actually made money with the network. Um, and if it, in share sale, it's, it's easy to tell. If they're at limited status, that means they have not received their, 50, their first $50 check. Uh, if, if they're, and and I, I still look at them. I look at their domains, but most of those that are at the limited are not that savvy in affiliate marketing yet. So we might have to make a judgment call and, and decline them, but in the decline email, I will say, um, if I made a mistake, then let me know. Uh, and we do get replies saying, I didn't put in, you know, my, my domain was, was listed wrong and I didn't add any other domains that I have. So please give us a second chance. And they, we always give them a second chance. So uh, just to add something on, it, that's really, it's really the first half of it. So anybody that says that they can catch 100% of the bad people that do things wrong on affiliate application is not telling the truth. Like, you can't because they do a really good job at hiding it. Um, and they can look really attractive. I mean, there's been some really good looking sites, page rank for, you know, like they, they look like they get traffic and we found them doing some, some pretty shady stuff and we had to kick them out of the program. So anybody that says that up front, that's, that's and, just to make it clear, I, don't, I, I think we all say that, look, we can't be 100% perfect on that. The important part is really after the fact, um, making sure that you're looking at the program, monitoring it, and if you see an affiliate go from zero to number one affiliate in, in 24 hours, um, that's an enormous red flag. And, and then, of course, now they've even gotten savvy um, where they'll pace themselves, right, to get to the point like, oh, I'm only gonna cookie stuff for you know one hour a day, and then I'll do it two hours a day, and then so on and so on and so on. So th there's, you have to be paying attention um, to who's selling you, who's sending you the sales. There are some services out there. One in particular that I'd like to give a shout out to is iPensatory. 
um, they are fantastic at finding stuff. So I'd recommend taking a look there as well. All right, time for some audience questions. You know you've got some. Go ahead and head up to the mic. You can go ahead and make a line at the mic if you want. Anybody that wants to ask, we've got a while. Oh, oh can you go over to the mic for me? Thank you. All right, go ahead. Hi, Tricia. Hi. Um, I have a question. We don't have any coupon offers. I'm an affiliate manager, and for I, I'm an affiliate manager for my own product. Um, and we don't offer any coupon deals or any discounting. So I mainly work with content sites and article, article sites. Um, you know, how can I help these people with writing articles that fit with our brand? Um, can I write the article, write an example article and teach them how to change it for SEO purposes? Or, you know, like our, our product's very technical. It has a medical element to it. So it needs a lot of education and they might not have the time to learn it all. So how can I help them and not give them the article? So what kind of content can you, can you yeah. give them and help them with? Maybe take that? I, I'll say that uh, I think you could, um, I, I, A, I think the best affiliates are gonna be the ones that are familiar with what it is that you do already. Um, to have to teach somebody, it's gonna certainly be a longer process, but probably totally worth it. You could absolutely write them articles. Um, we'll do that for affiliates sometimes as well. So oh, really? yes, you could absolutely write, write them articles, point them to locations where you um, get your information, and then also remember that you live, breathe, do this all day, every day. So no, no um, aspect is too small. Think about just, I mean, from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. or however long that, that you work, what you do day in and day out, and make an, uh, give them the idea for the article. A lot of times that's all they need is just an idea of where to get started on something like that. And don't think because it's, it's regular for you yeah. that it's not as exciting for them because it will be. Yeah, I would add to that and say um, not only the article ideas but also the products they could be writing about. So we encourage a lot of our content affiliates to um, take our products and create lists and then they can talk about the products in any way that they want but at least we're giving them the idea of the products so we'll do you know top 10 treats or best treats for traveling or um, best products for traveling, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, so there, I think there's a lot of ways that you could take the information you know about your product and share that with your affiliates to help them create the content that would be beneficial for your brand. Okay. You can also do lots of videos and seminars to, or webinars to bring in those affiliates and, and have good content to give them uh, and, and have some brainstorming sessions with them. Find out what they need uh, and then you can deliver it back, back to them. So Re Rebecca says something really good here too, like lists, top 10 this, you know, best seven ways to do this. And, and I really like what Greg said too, uh, videos. Nobody, nobody realizes YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world, right? So yeah. uh, if you're not doing videos, then, then you're missing out on an enormous, enormous visitor population right there. So to provide videos like tutorials for the affiliates or to tell them to do it for their audience? Uh, have them do a video review is, mm -hmm. a, is one great way to do it uh, of your okay. specific product. And depending on how many affiliates you have and how close you are to them, um, we also sometimes do like Skype video interviews with the owners of companies yes. because we want to introduce them to our readers. And so we'll do yeah. you know a, you know a ten minute video and say, hey, we we're talking to so and so today. Tell us a little bit more about your products, and then it's good content for them. But then you've got that out on YouTube as well. And Great. talk to the network that you you belong okay. to and ask them what type of resources they can help you with. Okay, thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if I may, when you're pitching yourself to your client base, what do you say about yourself and how do you differentiate yourself from other people that do the same thing and what is your product promise? So pitching to the merchants to hire you or to the affiliates how, to work with yeah, you? Yeah, how do you get clients and what do you say about yourself when you're out there in the marketplace trying to bring them in? How long do we have? <laughs> Go ahead and start, Meg. I'll set you off after a while. <laughs> For us, it's, it's a lot about people, process, and product. Um, so people, we have fantastic people. Each We have a pod that we have of um, affiliate managers. We have an affiliate manager with two affiliate relations managers underneath them, and then they even have some outsourced help underneath. Each pod is responsible for about 10 or fewer clients. It's really revenue-driven, depending on how, many, uh, how much revenue those clients bring in. So that's our people. And, and, 
And of course, I'm biased, but I feel like we have just the best in the business. They, they're fantastic. Um, process, our, our launch process as an example is over 200 points that we do from zero to launch, whether you're a new merchant or a relaunch. Um, so we have processes for absolutely everything to make sure that we don't miss something. Like when I talked about those emails and how it has the network, the, the uh, program name and, and the description, that's a template that we built that we make sure that we, we use every single time. Um, our product, the biggest thing about our product that sets us apart is our technology and there's, there's three pieces of it. One is affiliaterecruitment.com. Basically, we've spidered the internet. Um, we've crawled it, found every content affiliate site that we could find. I will never say that we found every single one because that wouldn't be true, but we found uh, a heck of a lot of them. Um, we're still indexing, but when we're done, it'll be about a million. Um, so we're able to go in, so I'll give you an example. Groupon just signed up as a, as a client of ours. Um, first thing that we'll do is go in and uh, uh, look up all Living Social affiliates, right? And just type in Living Social, get back the list, we get back page rank, um, Alexa rating, contact info, and so on. Sort it, go after the biggest ones first, and bring the most value to the program immediately. Uh, we also have the pixel container technology uh, that lets, allows us to deduplicate across multiple networks, as well as uh, let PPC affiliates, if the merchant allows, put the Google conversion tracker in. And we have a reporting system that goes across networks. And for example, I can take, uh, let's use Retail Me Not as an example. Um, if they're affiliate 1234 on CJ and 5678 on Linkshare, we can unify it, we can see how they do across the board and identify where they're up and they're down uh, throughout the year. So our people, process, and product are, are what sets us apart. Congrats on the group line. I didn't know that was officially announced yet. Yeah. <laughs> it is now. Yeah. <laughs> it is now. <laughs> Rebecca. Um, well, I am not recruiting merchants. I'm recruiting affiliates since I have an in-house program. But for us, it's really all about the Pet360 story and all the different areas of our company that we can offer to our affiliates. So um, Pet360 is just a, a really great brand. We're not only offering commerce, but we're also offering content and community on our website. And I think that makes it an easy story to convince affiliates to work with us because we have that broad offering to pet parents. Um, we also have different areas of our company. We have a um, Pet360 media team and we also have a blog pause network for our bloggers. So because we have those other areas, we can not only offer the affiliate side of the business, but we can also offer the media side of the business for anyone who wants to work with us. Greg? Mine's pretty simple. Um, I am the affiliate manager. I have a team that works with me. Everyone has their own duties. Uh, and we will only work with you if we have the time and patience. Right. Next question. Um, hi, my name is EMA. I from Head Offers, and uh, we are actually supply the platform for the network and affiliate. So my question is, maybe I forgot the, uh, I missed the first part. Why it is so bad working with uh, like a uh, bad performance affiliate? But for the, uh, for example, for the network, if you are having uh, like a bunch of offers, it wouldn't like uh, the more affiliates that you have will be like uh, bringing more conversion rate. So, but like from what I sound from you guys, like uh, oh we don't want to work with you guys until your performance is really good. So my first question is why it's so bad to working with uh, um, like bad performance affiliate? How do you actually marry identify to help the network targeting the like a better performance of it is instead of the, uh, the poor performance of it. I, I think that I understand. Um, it, it, you're asking, and just nod if, if this is, are asking why we don't work with affiliates that send a lot of clicks and not a lot of sales? Um, it's like, how do you identify the affiliate that is the, because a lot of affiliate want to like work with the network, uh -huh. but you don't know them and you don't know their performance. Uh -huh. Oh, how, do you, how do you identify bad affiliates? Exactly. Okay. okay. I talked a lot, so I, <laughs> yeah, I want to hear. Um, as I mentioned before, I mean, at the end of the day, we're always looking at how many new customers you're sending us and the percent of new customers coming from your program. So that's typically a good identifier for us. Um, and then, you know, I would also say going back to the click stream, we can typically identify bad affiliates from that um, and having an understanding of, you know, how quickly a click is occurring after another affiliate's. Um, so I think there's probably a lot of different things that we're looking at, but those are probably two of the major ones. We have very clear terms of service. 
And if any affiliates are going to violate those terms of service, they will not be affiliates very long in our programs. So we, we spell it out exactly what you can and cannot do. And if we see any behavior that is against the terms, we will notify you and you need to correct it fast or you won't be part of the program. Can I ask, are you a merchant or are you a network? Um, I'm a platform supplier. You're, you're a network? Yeah. So, okay, so you're, you're asking how do you know they're bad before they even do any performance? Yeah, and, so, and the, yeah. The, the, my, the answer to that is you won't always, so you know, you, you, you're going to have to know that some people are going to get through, but you can make it hard. Right? Um, and if you make it harder for them than everybody else does, there's so many people that they go and take advantage of because they don't have proper management that they're not going to go after you. And ways that you can do that is, you know, um, you can make them verify that the site that they're promoting, that they actually own it. There's a couple ways to do that. You can have the sign-up email match the domain that they're saying is theirs, right? You can have them put maybe a piece of pixel on their uh, website verifying as theirs or a line of code, anything that helps them verify that there's that. Some networks have even gone so far as to require a um, credit card deposit to verify that you are you, uh, and then they turn around and refund that to you. So there's a lot of ways out there to, to help understand who they are. And if you just make it, you make it easy enough to get in that you're not scaring away affiliates, but hard enough where if I was being shady and you were going to kick me out over and over and over again, I wouldn't want to go through the time and the expense, they'll leave you alone. And my next question is, like, after you identify the good affiliate, how do you like keep maintaining the good relationship with the affiliate? Because you want to be attractive to the affiliate, you want to identify. Sure. I want to give you like more, maybe more commissions since that you bring in more customers. How do you like? What exactly? How do you attractive so, to your affiliates? So just repeat, and I'll, I'll be quiet. Uh, once you have identify the the good affiliates, how do you maintain that relationship? How do you grow that relationship? Great. We talk to them as much as possible. Hopefully they will reply to us uh, and we will give them anything they need. Um, you know, we will we work with them as, as much as possible. But it, it, it's going to be communication. It has to be a two-way street. So the affiliates ha have to reply to us. So if you're an affiliate, please answer your aff affiliate managers. All right. Kush, ready for you. All right. Hi, my name is Kush. I'm the affiliate program manager for VM Innovations. I had a quick question. Um, what's been your favorite recruitment strategy lately, and how much time do you spend on recruitment uh, of new affiliates to your program? Rebecca? Um, my new favorite is a site called Thomason.com, and um, the way that Thomason works is you offer product reviews to bloggers who are signed up for Thomason. So what we've done is um, offered some free product to the people on Thomason. Some of them will get the product, others will just show interest in reviewing the product, and in that case, we can reach out to them to join our affiliate program. So it's been really successful for us. We've gotten probably over 500 requests for product reviews just in maybe the past month. So it's been really exciting and uh, definitely a great site for anyone to check out. And how much time do you spend recruit, re recruiting new affiliates? What would you say, percentage-wise? <laughs> uh, I would say... I would probably say 5% of my time right now is spent with recruitment. I'd like that to be a lot more. I schedule it on my calendar to do every week a lot more, but um, that t typically falls to the bottom for us. So right now uh, we're doing some cleanup of our program, which is taking priority. I would have liked for Thomas to remain a secret, but that, that, was, <laughs> that was gold. That was gold, people. Um, <laughs> T-O-M-O-S-O-N. Got to go find a new site. Now. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, and as far as recruitment goes, again, we have our, our technology that allows us to find affiliates. We don't rely completely on that. Um, there's great ways you can do it. You, you can find social affiliates by uh, going to Twitter and doing searches for specific words and using the URL from a network. So, um, and they'll come up and you can see which tweeters are affiliates. Uh, another great way is uh, a company called the Search Monitor. Um, you can find PPC affiliates that way. And then, of course, our, our software, affiliatecruitment.com, that, that gets us every content affiliate, well, not every, almost every content affiliate that we need. So uh, that's how we recruit. And we spend, I think it was Kush, Kush that I, uh, we actually spend about half our time recruiting. Um, we know that that's the lifeblood of the program and, and what makes us, um, makes the program grow. And we, we are ultimately responsible for the growth of that program. So that's what we do. 
Greg? We're all responsible for recruiting on my team, but Sabrina is, is our full-time recruiter right now. And her um, task for the last couple months has been inspired by Wade and Aaron at Fanatics. She is going after Facebook um, pages, and, and we're seeing great success with, with uh, in, in whatever category, whatever niche it is, to go after and look for Facebook pages that are relevant to that merchant. So we're seeing great success with that. And I just want to add one thing. I think um, that question really speaks to how um, agencies can help with affiliate management. I'm an in-house program, and so my time is really divided amongst many things, one being affiliate programs, others, other parts of our business I also work on. Um, so, you know, while these guys can have full-time recruiters and really spend a lot of time going after that, for me, because I'm an in-house program, it's a little bit less. Although we still have a really successful program. So there's definitely um, benefits to working with agencies versus in-house programs. Listen to Rebecca. Agencies are great. <laughs> we have time for one more question if you want to go ahead. Hi. Oh, jeez. Oh. Hi, I'm MJ. I work with Rich Dad Education. We're pretty new to the affiliate program. My question to you is we do financial seminars, online seminars, live events throughout the country and worldwide. And one of the things we're starting to see is unsubscribes. And internally, we have our own unsubscribe um, policy that we have to follow. But when we get them through an affiliate or a link that's out there, and we don't necessarily know where they're coming from um, specifically, how do you handle so that you don't get complaints and so forth? Because recently we've been getting those saying, I asked to unsubscribe, and these individuals are not in our database. We do a lot of online marketing to our events, and our online vendors don't have them in their lists and so forth. So we know it's coming from our affiliates. But how do you really reach out to them and make sure that, you know, that they no longer have this individual on their list, especially when you have so many affiliates? So I'll, I'll start and say, first and foremost, you need to have, I, we are very selective on any email person that we work with, and it has to be their list. It can't be a, a list that they acquired in any other way. We don't, even, we don't even allow them to do emails. It's through like banner ads and text ads. So, and they'll go to a banner. Let me try and understand the question. Somebody's clicking on an affiliate link, landing on your property, on signing up for a newsletter. Or, si or signing up for an event or signing up anywhere. It will say unsubscribe, and we'll get an unsubscribe. And we'll look for them in our database, right. and it's not anywhere. So we so know they it's were coming. getting information. They're in, on an affiliate's newsletter. Somewhere. And they want to unsubscribe from that affiliate's that's, newsletter. That's course. what I'm saying is that mm -hmm. if they're on an affiliate's newsletter, you, you need to have that in your terms and conditions. First and foremost, what? It's in there. Okay. The second is, if there is anybody generating any sort of traffic, you need to be on their email list. So take your email, go to their list, and see what they're doing, right? So if they're getting a, a tremendous amount of unsubscribe rates or people complaints, you need to see what they're doing because they're probably saying something that isn't correct about, about your company. Um, watch, watch very, very closely. Again, if, if these guys know that you're paying attention, there's plenty of people who they'll go in and exploit. They, won't, they don't need to do it to you. So just make sure they know you're watching and take action on it. Uh, that'll, that'll help you a lot. Anybody else? Uh, I would also say take a look at the number of unsubscribe requests that you're getting and compare that to what you believe their list size to be. Um, that'll give you a good understanding of whether or not the list that they say they have is legit um, or if they have a lot of um, inaccurate email addresses in their database. All right. Well, thank you all so much for coming. I am just thrilled with the turnout that we had. And um, thanks to you guys up here. They knew what they were getting into before all of this. So let's give them a big round of applause. <laughs>